Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are today. Welcome to our webinar, the Clean Facts webinar on neutralizing a threat with proper disinfection. Today's event is brought to you by Clean Facts and also our publisher, ISSA, the Worldwide Cleaning Association, and also our two sponsors, Procure and Victory Innovations. Before we officially get started, I want to share with you just a thought or two on why we're doing this webcast today. You know, cleaning and disinfection are a partnership and they must be done right. And you attending this webinar today are the guardians of health. Awareness of the importance of cleaning and disinfection is increasing every day. We see it in the news. In fact, I'm looking at two news articles right now. Uh, one of them in USA Today about reopening schools and how the CDC is asking these schools to use disinfection as one of the tools to reopen. In uh, Wall Street Journal, there's an article about the pandemic, the next pandemic, are we ready for it? Well, that's why we're here today to prepare for what's coming. I know all of you folks are in the field battling this coronavirus right now, but what about the next one? Maybe we uh, faltered a bit with this one as it started, but we can get better and get ready. So what I want you to do, what you should take away from this webinar would be information, strategies, and procedures to arm you to be your very best. So my name is Jeff Cross. I'm the media director for ISSA. And with me today as a moderator as well as Amanda Hosey. She's the managing editor of Clean Facts and handles that media brand. Also, we're going to uh, talk about our sponsors and our speakers in a moment. Of course, you're probably very familiar with the Clean Facts brand. Uh, Clean Facts is the print publication and digital publication for the cleaning and restoration industries. And we provide our content not only in print, but online in newsletters and in other ways of getting that information to you. But be sure if you don't receive Clean Facts to go to cleanfacts.com and subscribe to the magazine. Before we officially get started, I do want to uh, mention that we will be taking questions. So during this webcast, you can enter your questions in the portal for that. And we'll get to as many questions as we can and provide those responses from our expert speakers. Now, we do know that uh, you're probably muted automatically, but it doesn't hurt to also mute your phone or device as we go through this webcast. You will also receive a link after the webcast, uh, probably within hours or a day or two, with a recording of this. So if you registered for this, you will receive that. And of course, um, there'll be a playback of it on our website, cleanfacts.com. So before we get started, I would like to introduce Amanda Hosey, who's going to talk about our first sponsor. Hey everyone, um, I have a message here today from Procure. Uh, Procure is a solutions provider for disinfection and deodorization with chlorine dioxide products. Their products sell in dry packets requiring water to activate at the job site. This allows you to easily scale to any size project to save on the energy required in lugging heavy products to and from the treatment area and to save on waste that's tied to buying ready to use liquid in single use plastic containers. With Procure products, you can reuse your empty containers to make more product when needed. Their product line, Procure V, creates liquid chlorine dioxide, which is applied by sprayer, mop, or microfiber cloth. This extremely versatile product is on the EPA's list in, making it approved for use against SARS-CoV-2. It boasts numerous kill claims relevant to disinfection and deodorization, all while you can use the after use. Procure products are available today. For more information, contact Procure by web, phone, or email. Thank you, Amanda. Appreciate that. Well, I want to introduce today's speakers. We have two experts in the field of cleaning and, and disinfecting. Uh, the first one is Dr. Gavin McGregor, McGregor Skinner. He's a director of GBAC. He has more than 25 years of technical experience in emergency management and infectious disease surveillance and response. Gavin currently serves as assistant professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences at Penn State College of Medicine. And as well, we have uh, Jeff Jones, who is a director of forensic operations with GBAC and a GBAC master trainer. 
And Jeff has more than 50 years of experience in the field of forensic restoration and is the owner and operator of Biosheen of Texas. So we have both of our experts here with, with us today with presentations. And also they'll be here at the end of the presentation to uh, discuss the questions that you folks have offered us today. So Gavin, I believe you're up first. So tell us uh, what do you know about our topic today? Well, this is really important, Jeff, in that we've seen so much of our business expand. We've seen so many opportunities for the cleaning industry in the last you know, 12 months or so. But we, we did this before. Before 2020, in 2019, and even before then, we did focus on infectious disease agents, whether they be viruses or bacteria. Now, it's really important, so much of the work that you, know, you and I have done and others have done in flu season, the fact that we know that schools and other buildings around the country used to close down for three to four days and they'd use this term deep clean and no one really knew what it meant. Um, but the idea was they would go in and would try to decrease the amount of virus, we call that the viral load, decrease the amount of virus in those buildings because absenteeism or people getting sick was the indicator. So instead of being preventive, preventing illnesses, yeah, we were, we were reacting. And so what we find right now, Jeff, we've had things like flu season, norovirus. You know, the, my big concern was hepatitis. You know that hepatitis, the hepatitis virus can, can survive and be infective on surfaces for six weeks. And so every time I've responded to a hepatitis C outbreak, for example, a hepatitis A outbreak, I'm really worried about surfaces and I'm really worried about cleaning and disinfection protocols and procedures. So right now, everyone's very aware. We see all the government agencies, we see different organizations talking about cleaning and disinfection, but a lot of that detail is la lacking. What, how, do we know, how, would, how do we know what to clean? How do we know how to do it? How do we know that we've, we can validate it and do it properly? Um, and again, you know, there's certain areas with inside a building that scare the daylights out of me, and there's certain areas that I would go into with not being too worried about. So again, we've got to understand, based on our hazard identification, our risk, what needs to be done and where. So a lot of what we've been dealing with uh, is myths, myths and rumors. Uh, right now, social media uh, platforms like, gosh, Facebook, Twitter can be both beneficial for the cleaning industry. They can help us uh, market our products. They can help us visualize and show both photos and videos of what we do. But also, it's made every person in the country, in the world, an expert. And it's really easy to share um, these, again, people, general people in the public share opinions to a large audience. And so one of the discussions is that sanitizing is the same as or very similar to disinfecting. And I don't really need to sanitize or disinfect. I need to clean and that's all I do. And, and then again, we, I've just, you, know, you and I have been talking just recently, Jeff, I've been looking at some of the CDC documents that came out just on Friday, February the 12th. And it says in that you clean visible, dirty surfaces. Well, hang on. You're going to listen to Jeff Jones in a minute, and he's going to say that dirt is both visible and invisible. Now, I know I deal with infectious disease agents. I deal with viruses and bacteria. And guess what? They're an invisible enemy. You can't see them. So we're trying to tell, as a cleaning industry, tell the public, tell people what we do, but in a way that doesn't cause alarm, it promotes confidence and trust. Uh, the word disinfecting, for some reason, some people find that scary. They find it, oh gosh, what this is, and, and so we see a lot of companies now use the word sanitizing because it, they believe it's more acceptable as a term. And again, there's less hysteria, less panic, but what they're actually doing, when we look at their protocols and their procedures, they're actually cleaning and disinfecting, but they're calling it sanitization. And again, so there's an area there based, based on marketing, keeping everyone calm, uh, getting things done. But when it comes to cleaning and disinfecting, cleaning removes some, some of the dirt, removes some of the infectious disease agents, whether it be viruses and bacteria, but to actually kill the bacteria or inactivate the viruses, to decrease the risk of getting infected, of getting disease, you have to disinfect. Sanitize kills some of the some of these viruses and bacteria, that doesn't kill all of them. And again, what I tell my students, both at Harvard, where I teach, as well as Penn State College of Medicine, uh, and again, this is something I learned from Jeff Jones, you write down the number one million. And then when you go and look at a product, it will tell you 
and it's called the log reduction number. It tells you what, 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 what this product does, but more importantly, you need to visualize it. So if you write down the number 100, if it says it's a three log reduction, you cross off three zeros off the number 1 million and you still have a thousand particles. You still have a thousand infectious virus particles. And that's really about what sanitizing would do. To disinfect, we're looking at a six log reduction, or at least a six log reduction. So you write down the number 1 million and when you see that six log reduction, you cross off six zeros. If it's five log reduction, you cross off five zeros and therefore you've got less chance of infection. Now we know for many infectious diseases, how much of that dose you need. And we know from, you know, from for, 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 for SARS-CoV-2 virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, it's around about a thousand particles. Some of the new variants have decreased that to maybe 600 virus particles to 800 virus particles. I know Jeff, when I worked with Ebola in 2014, I was scared of Ebola when I went to an Ebola hospital and it may have been 10 virus particles that could lead to a virus infection. But we know for SARS-CoV-2, it's around about anywhere from 600 to 1,000. So if you start with a million, and there's many more, there's billions actually, there's lots of virus out there, but you start with that number. And again, we explain why we disinfect and not just sanitize to create a safe indoor environment. Next slide, please. This is, this is a great question. This, this, this carpet and upholstery. Can it be disinfected? And then the challenge we have, uh, again, we follow the guidelines from the um, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and they have published on their website what's called the EPA List N. And this is all the disinfectant products, the products that have active ingredients. And again, we're focusing on the chemistry of those active ingredients that can inactivate. And, and again, what's really important to understand is viruses like flu, the influenza virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus are envelope viruses. They are the easiest of all the germs to inactivate or, or, or kill. We, we use the word inactivate because they aren't living, li living things. But to break down that envelope, soap and water does a great job at breaking down that envelope. That's why when we wash our hands with soap and water, it will get rid of the virus, but also breaks down the envelope so the virus can't cause infections. So much of our focus when, it's come, when it comes to cleaning disinfection has been on these hard non-porous services. And if you go to the, the, the US government's Environmental Protection Agency list N, you'll see the majority of over 500 products are really focused on hard non-porous services. You know, things like tabletops, floors, and, and walls. It's been really challenging to educate both the cleaning professionals as well as the general public on what you can do for carpet, what you can do for couches, beds, pillows, and other soft, uh, other soft, soft surfaces. And there's still a lot of mixed messaging out there. You need to follow the manufacturer's directions when it comes to cleaning carpet and, and, and soft furnishings. There are also ways that we can use cleaning agents, soap and water, to actually break down that virus envelope and decrease the risk of infection. But again, this is still a really muddy, murky area, Jeff, where we aren't really, we're clear on what to do those hard, non-porous services because we've got this EPA list, but we don't have a government list for soft surfaces, for example, the, the porous surfaces. And that's something we as a cleaning industry need to focus on. Next slide, please. This is really important that, that, that disinfecting contaminated surfaces. Well, we, the unfortunate thing is we can't see bacteria. We can't see viruses. We don't know how much virus is on a surface because we just can't see it. It's an invisible enemy. And it's really interesting in that when you look at the CDC guidelines that came out, it said clean visibly dirty surfaces with soap and water. But we know that dirt is both visible and invisible. We know the viruses and the bacteria are, are invisible. Disinfecting a surface, if you follow the manufacturer's directions, you need to read those labels. You need to read the, the label of the product you're using, the cleaning agent, or even the disinfectant agent you're using, and follow what the manufacturer says to do. Now, the biggest challenge we have here is that it's, it, a lot of the, the labels on the back of the bottles, the containers we have, have actually listed what's called dwell or wet contact time. Now, most of the cleaning staff I work with, they don't wear a watch. They don't have timers on their cleaning carts. And so when you run an industry that has to focus on the dwell or wet contact time, because that's science-based, that's at the time it takes for that 
active ingredient in that product to break down the wall of the virus or the bacteria to make it so it's not infective. And then you're working with an industry that don't, that, that don't wear watches, that don't carry timers. And it's really important that one of our biggest gaps within the clean industry is if we believe in the science and those wet contact times are the best essence we have on how to make the environment safe, how to make the surface safe, then we need a way to track that time. And if we, what we do know based on science and evidence and studies, if you apply the product and it might have a five or even a 10 minute wet contact time, then yes, that, 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 that surface is safe. It'll become reinfected over time when people keep touching as people move into the building, but it is safe if you follow that cleaning and disinfecting process. Biggest gap we have right now is that we don't wear watches and we don't carry timers. Next slide, please. Right, this is so 2019-ish. And the challenge we have here is that we all made good money. We all supported our families. We, this is a, you know, we, we, the great, a great industry. The clean industry has been around for years because we could clean stuff and make it shine. We could clean stuff and make it smell nice or better. You know, when we, we spent so many years focusing on how to take cigarette and cigar smoke out of carpets and curtains and other, other furnishings. But, and again, so, so much of what we do has been focused on clean and shine, clean and disinfect. When we had to pivot, when we had to do a complete 180 degree turn and in 2020 and focus on cleaning and disinfection to make indoor environments, indoor spaces safe was really challenging for the industry. Can we validate our cleaning and disinfection for an infectious disease agent based on visual, based on shininess, based on smell? No, we can't. And so we really have to focus here on what are the validation techniques that some of you are using, more of you should be using, and then how do we actually keep those valid? How do we ensure those validation techniques are science-based? Well, one of the validation techniques we have is, you know visual observation of your protocols, procedures, or standard operating procedures to show that you followed the protocol, cleaning, and then disinfecting. We've seen a, 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 just an enormous uh, culture behind ATP testing, stadiums, hotels, arenas, airports, buses, trains, planes, all these um, facilities that did not use ATP meters in 2019 are now using them in 2020. Are they using them the way they were designed to be used? Are they taking enough swabs and samples on a regular frequent basis to, to actually gather data that could be used for evidence, uh, for decision-making? And so as we move away from the 2019 paradigm of, yeah, we can make things smell good, what the cleaning industry needs to clearly understand the future is going to still be about cleaning and disinfection based on infectious disease agents. And it's not just the SARS-CoV-2 virus, because we know the SARS-CoV-2 virus will most likely, we're not sure, but most likely become like the flu. It's gonna be here for a long time. But let's not forget about the norovirus, viruses that are out there, uh, the hepatitis that are out there. Oh, again, flu that's out there, but also some of the bacteria. So we've seen some big salmonella outbreaks, Jeff, in the last 12 months, which really you know, come down to cleaning surfaces properly to decrease that risk of infection. Next slide, please. Uh, technology. This is great. This has been so exciting for us. We have seen a number of delivery systems expand exponentially across so many service providers and across so many facilities. Uh, in, through our ISSA GBAC STAR program, one of the elements is about giving us information on and sharing information with us about the equipment that you use. And we've seen everything. We've seen everything from an expansion of foggers, sprayers, misters, to electrostatic sprayers, to UVC light technology, um, to ionization technology, you name it, it's, it's, we've seen it. What's really important is a lot of this technology for me is, is exciting, but it works in certain areas. It doesn't work everywhere. And it's really important that when you buy a piece of equipment, when you buy a black box, when you buy something that you understand what you're buying and understand you read the manufacturer's directions, where it can be used and what you can put into it. So it is used the way it was designed to be used. And that's our biggest challenge at the moment. What we've seen across so many facilities you know, that we work with through our GBAC Star program is people buy stuff, they put it in a room where they think it's going to work. And then because we're evidence-based, science-based, we come or others come in and work out and go, 
well, that was a lot of money you just spent, but it doesn't do a damn thing in decreasing the risk of getting infected from a, a virus, for example. You could have taken a simpler, easier pathway, like cleaning and disinfecting the surfaces um, based on use to, to, to de decrease that risk. So technology for me is exciting only when it's evidence-based and it's used appropriately. Next slide, please. This has been really important. Education, training, awareness, understanding what we do. And this, is, this goes back to really the fundamentals. I can't emphasize enough the questions that, that the GBAC star team get, the whole advisory board gets. I get personally on a day-to-day -day basis. Can we do this? Can I do that? And it all comes down to education and training. There is a science behind proper cleaning procedures. There's a science behind using appropriate disinfectants. And it's really important we understand that. There is also a way that we have to work together as a cleaning industry, as a team, to explain to decision makers and the general public what we do works and how we do it. And how we can actually, again, in, in, in my experience, adults learn by doing. And it's really important that, that our training focuses on learning by doing not going on to the websites we go on now. Say we go onto the CDC website. It's pages and pages and pages of documents. It says how to clean and disinfect any facility. You need to develop a plan. Then you need to determine what needs to be cleaned. You need to determine what areas need to be in, uh, disinfected. You need to consider the resources and equipment needed. You need to implement. You need to use the appropriate cleaning. You need to follow the directions on the label. And then you need to be able to maintain and revise and continue that consistency of, of cleaning and disinfection. It's a lot to take in. It's a lot to read. And then you need to visualize, oh, actually, for my cleaning company, how do I do that? And we need to be more proactive through training. The value of training. The value of training is you, you, you learn by doing. And we have so many variations, so many challenges when it comes to indoor spaces. It's not a one size fits all. There's a lot of variation out there indoors, in indoor spaces. And we need to be a team Again, form a team across the cleaning industry. Say, this is how we clean this particular area. And this is how we clean this this other area. What really scares me right now? Bathrooms, restrooms. Really, really scare me. Elevators. When I go inside an elevator, and I know that there's been lots of people in that elevator breathing and touching things, and that hasn't been cleaned. Um, there are certain parts of buildings that, for my risk assessment has a higher risk, a higher chance of me being infected than other parts of the building. So it's really important we understand that. It's not a one size fits all, but I really think the future for the cleaning industry is an appropriate, properly designed professional development program at all levels, right down to the essential frontline janitorial staff, all the way up to managers, supervisors, and decision, and decision managers, and owners of companies in, a, in an appropriate professional development program. And I think we're going to see that happen pretty soon. And I think we're going to see that, that it's something that's going to be a value for the whole community. Next slide, please. Actually, Gavin, that's your last slide. I know you have more to say, so stick around for the Q&A that will follow. But nice job and great information. And I too am afraid of most restrooms, but uh, that's another story. So, well, we'll now get into our next sponsor message. Amanda, tell us about the next one. Thanks, Jeff. Um, just because a surface looks clean doesn't mean it is. Take charge of disinfecting your space and get back to business sooner with Victory Innovations. With fast touchless application, easy lightweight handling and effective disinfectant coverage that reaches even the most hard to clean areas, Electrostatic sprayers from Victory Innovations are setting a new standard in clean. Discover it for yourself by requesting a free virtual demo today at victoryinnovations.com. Back to you, Jeff. Thank you, Amanda. And uh, I know you're busy behind the scenes getting our questions ready for our presenters, but now we're gonna invite Jeff Jones coming to us from Oklahoma City, which is undergoing rolling blackouts, I believe. So if he disappears, we'll know why. But Jeff, take it away and tell us about this slide. Thank you very much. You know, back in the days of traditional martial arts training in Japan, there were really only three belt colors, white, brown, and black. White meant that you were a new student and beginning to learn that particular discipline of martial arts. Brown meant that you'd been training for years and now your belt was getting dirty from all your training. Black 
meant that you'd been training for so long that your belt was filthy now from all the blood, sweat, and tears that you had poured into training. And traditionally, it took about 10 years of training to become a black belt. If you look at the old photos, those belts were about ready to fall apart. And then you were given your ceremonial black belt. And what this meant was now you were not an expert by any means. Now you're a serious student. I'm in my 50th year of remediating the mishaps and mayhem of the human condition, and it is an honor to do so. But I'm not by any means an expert. I'm a student. I'm a serious student. And so everyone that's on here today, you honor me with your time and your presence. And so let's tear right into it. If you know not yourself or the enemy, you'll face certain defeat on the battlefield. If you know yourself and not the enemy, you'll face defeat half of the time on the battlefield. And if you know yourself and the enemy, you need not fear a thousand battles. That's from Sun Tzu from the Art of War. So how do you get to know yourself? Through training, proper training. Notice I didn't say learning. Little kids learn. Warriors train. While people are out there dying from this infectious agent, you better believe, partner, this is microbial warfare. So how do we learn about our enemies? Through constant research from gathering in data. We're on a global uh, pandemic right now, but actually we had one just prior to that, the H1N1 influenza virus. And now we're under the uh, SARS coronavirus COVID-19. That's two back-to-back -back pandemics. But here's what they've got in common. They're both enveloped viruses should be the easiest ones on the food scale to negotiate. If I were going to do uh, a belt system for microbial threats, then envelope viruses would be the white belts. Well, guess what? The whole world just got its rear end kicked by a white belt. We're not even ready for when the black belt shows up, but we can get there and we'll get there through proper training, getting ready for that. Next slide, please. When I was a kid, I used to run home from school every day because Star Trek was going to be on. And if you watch that, the real Star Trek with Captain James Kirk, who um, was good in a fist fight and dated green women. He worked for the Federation of Planets. And there was a prime directive, cannot, shall not, will not interfere with pre-existing civilizations. In the world of forensic restoration, there is a prime directive safety, cannot, shall not, will not be violated. I don't care if the person has their first day out in the field, they have a right to call a halt to all operations if there's a safety violation. That's why we have that little shot there, that silhouette of Spock. If you follow the prime directive of safety, you will live long and prosper. Next slide, please. This is a team, this is not in a studio, this isn't posed for, this is actually out in the field operations. They're doing a tactical entry. And you know, that is a word that is so used today. You have tactical weapons, tactical clothing. I've got, this is like really cute. I've got an Uzi tactical pen. And most people don't even know what that word means. So let me give it to you. Uh, right now from a former FBI trained SWAT team leader. Tactical means having a plan to get from point A to point B safely. So what this team is doing right here, they're making a tactical entry and they're pre-disinfecting with an EPA registered hospital grade tuberculocidal disinfectant proven to kill both gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria and inactivate both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. From the point of their entry, by the way, their delivery system is a ULV. Their disinfectant also has a surfactant in it. Why? The ULV, we're utilizing that because we want to get this floor surface wet. And we're using something with a surfactant in it because we want to get that microbial threat to adhere to that surface. So their plan is 
to work their way in from the point of entry and work their way to the first return on the HVAC system. Next slide, please. Here they're gonna precondition the HVAC return with the fan on with an EPA registered hospital grade tuberculocidal disinfectant with a six log kill approved for HVAC systems. Next slide. From there, they'll work their way to the farthest point of the house on the floor system, and then they'll work their way up and then right back out to their point of entry. So they've worked their way in on the floor to minimize tracking and transfer of microbial agents, and then working their way out on the vertical surfaces. And they'll, um, I hate this word, but they'll fog that room also. The three major components of any forensic restoration project are structure, contents, indoor air quality, and not necessarily in that order. Next slide, please. The next thing that's going to happen on that is the cleaning and washing of the flooring materials. Again, to minimize tracking and transfer. We know that transfer can happen for a minimum of 20 feet. This was proven by Dr. Eric Brown out of Otley, England. So these floors are swept, vacuumed, and then wet washed in excess of 120 degrees and then rapidly dried. Next, Next slide, please. Uh, that was on the concrete uh, subfloor right through there. Here we're using a different apparatus. This is called an IMOP, so there's no cords or anything. Uh, it runs off lithium batteries. It is a self-contained extraction machine, uh, but this is for hard surfaces. If I were, you know, as a field operator, they said, don't say brands, don't do that. Or, hey, come on. I work in the real world. If I were uh, on the third floor and I was working on indoor, outdoor carpets, I'd probably just grab a clean ride extractor and go to work on that. Next. Now we're going into uh, cleaning. Uh, the first thing that we're going to do is dry clean. Why? Talk to anybody that cleans oriental textiles and rugs for a living and they're gonna tell you the first thing that they're going to do is dust that rug to get all the dry sediment off. Uh, I once uh, dusted a nine by 12 Karastan rug and got 56 pounds of dirt out of a nine by 12 Karastan rug. So what they're using right here is disposable microfiber pads. They're going to dry clean every surface, both vertical and horizontal to prep that for wet cleaning. Everything that we do, each step is simply to set things in motion for the next step. Next slide, please. This is like, this is just a, a microfiber, disposable microfiber pad showing some of the soil that was taken off the vertical surfaces, the walls, okay? This is not visibly a dirty house, but it's what you cannot see, which can make you sick and or kill you, DED dead. I'm a graduate of the Oklahoma Public School, thank you. So uh, after they've done the dry cleaning, then that sets up the next step, which is, next slide, wet cleaning. Here they're gonna use an EPA registered hospital grade tuberculocidal disinfectant with a six log kill, but also a surfactant. You're gonna need that surfactant to get that foaming action. And once this is applied, they'll keep these surfaces wet for 10 minutes. With why? Because that's what it's on the manufacturer's label is dwell time of 10 minutes. Contact is when we spray it. Dwell time is how long that is visibly wet. So you need to check the labels on the particular product that you're using. Next, please. So if we've done our dry cleaning, we've done our wet cleaning, and what is the definition of cleaning? Cleaning is the removal of soil, both visible and invisible. 
forensic cleaning though, is the removal of biological contaminants and pathogens to prepare surfaces, both vertical and horizontal for professional disinfecting. Now this is off another incident site. This is a, an attempted self cessation via laceration. And so uh, you can see visible bio there, but you never ever test your ATP in visible bio. We're gonna use the ATP, why? Because the ATP meter was simply designed to measure a level of cleanliness. It was designed for the food and beverage industry, actually, and then we, it found its way into the restoration world. But also remember, you know, you can see um, blood right through there, but not everything that comes out of a human body is crimson red or brain matter gray. In an average 200 pound body, there are over 120 pounds of bodily fluids and some of them are invisible to the eye. Next slide. And so here's that, that incident site. Here's their pre-ATP score, 9,339. Pretty high. Next slide. Same incident, different colored glove. Why? This is good. This is good field notes. We wear two different colors of gloves. We wear a minimum of two pair and usually three when we're out in the field. If you put on this bright shade of yellow first and then a blue, if you compromise your blue, you'll easily see the rip or the tear through that visible yellow right there. But what is the, what is the score now? This is just after forensic cleaning. We went from 9,339 to a six, we went down into a single digit. Now we've prepped that surface for the disinfectant. You cannot disinfect a dirty or contaminated surface. Surface preparation through forensic cleaning is everything. You would never wax a dirty car. You would never scotch guard a dirty piece of carpet. You've got to prep the surfaces through proper cleaning techniques. Next slide. And this is a forensic operator's favorite score after cleaning, zero. This shows that this is one of the cleanest environments that we can obtain. Now that disinfectant, that EPA registered hospital grade tuberculocidal disinfectant with a six log kill can do what we want it to do. We're not disinfecting, we're applying a disinfectant, but we've got to prep that surface so the disinfectant can do its job properly. Next slide, please. These are same job. Uh, these just happen to be the delivery systems that we're going to be using it out there. You know, professional disinfecting actually runs in three parts. There's the disinfectant, which I've described as that EPA registered hospital grade, tuberculocidal disinfectant, six log kill. That's what I'm looking for. There's the delivery system. And then there's the operator. If one of those is out of whack, the whole system's out of whack. But if you've got a good disinfectant, a good delivery system, and a trained, skilled forensic operator, you have harmonics. And to be honest with you right now, if all of those are in harmonics, you don't need to be afraid of battle. There's not a pathogen out there that you can't negotiate. So I'll run down the list real quick. There's an electrostatic there, a foamer, there's a Tomy Steramist, there's a Bioplanet uh, 700, there's an ESS X, XT3, another ESS Max, and then a Bioplanet. And then uh, there is a handheld by Victory, um, which is really good if you get like in really tight uh, spots, corners underneath cabinets and things of that nature. Next slide, please. Now we've set, we've set everything up, just like a great boxer sets everything up for his last punch or a great pull shot sets up, he's three shots ahead in his mind. We've set everything up for the proper application of an EPA registered disinfectant. I think you can, I'm not gonna read that to you. I'm not gonna be redundant, but they were using an electrostatic sprayer there. And let me say something about electrostatic sprayers. It's a double-edged sword, okay? You've got to know what the micron size is on that. And actually 40 to 45 is the best charge to mass ratio
for electrostatic sprayers, but electrostatic spraying has been around for a long time. In fact, Harold Brunsberg back in the late thirties quit his college to go to work at his dad's paint store and developed this technology and landed his first government contract uh, painting bazookas and ammo crates for World War II. He called that Project One. In 1948, he ingeniously developed uh, Project Two and uh, patented that system. So that's been around for quite a while. But one of the things we've got complete coverage, but you've got to make sure, because these are small microns, that you get that proper dwell time. Because if you run in there at the speed and it's just expecting full coverage, but it dries before the dwell time, you wasted your time and you wasted product and you're not going to achieve the results that you wanted to get out of that. Next slide, please. Oh, and that's simply an operator out in the field, same project working and using a different delivery system. Next slide, please. I said at the beginning that your three major components are um, structure, contents, indoor air quality. Well, one of the things that uh, we're looking at right here, there's a brand new pre-filter. This is by Phoenix on this air scrubber right there, which is 99, can we go to the next slide? I wanna make sure I get this number right. It's been tested at uh, nine, over 99% on the H1N1 virus, though that's influenza, this will still work. They're both enveloped viruses on sars cov 19 And so we're working on both the structure, the contents, and the indoor air quality. That air handling system would be the final thing on this project to be cleaned utilizing the source removal method. Next slide. I believe that's it, Jeff. All right, let me, let me just give let me just give a final thought on this really quick because that this could go sideways. I could get a rolling blackout because we're under a blizzard. And if if anything, if nobody remembers anything that I said today, uh, because again, I'm not an expert. I just you know wanted to say this that right now the world doesn't need another reality TV star or even a politician. Right now. What the world needs are passionate microbial warriors with a heart for service. Because in the end, we're not just cleaners, okay? We are the caretakers of the human condition. Handle it with love because it's fragile, my friend. Thank you, Jeff. Very passionate and great presentation. Great information to take away. We're now going to do a few minutes of questions from our audience for both of you. Um, I'll do the first one. This one's for Gavin to start off with. Um, it seems, and here's the question, Gavin, it seems that there has been a lot of information about disinfecting surfaces, but what about the air? Should we pay more attention to air circulation and disinfection? What say you, Gavin? It's a good question, Jeff, and you need to understand what, what, how do you get infected? And people get infected because the virus or the bacteria has to enter your body and it enters your body through your holes. And your holes are your eyes, your nose, your mouth, or any cuts or abrasions on your skin. Now, the challenge we have, we've known for years that bacteria and viruses can stay, can, can be stay in the environment, in the, in, the, in the indoor spaces, in the air, for you know, minutes up to hours before they settle. We also know that there's a number of ways that we control indoor environments, say through humidity. You know, anything 60% and over in humidity adds more droplets to the air, that's humidity. And as droplets come out of your mouth when you cough or you sneeze, those droplets then hit other droplets and they hit the ground quicker. So where's the virus? The virus is now on the floor. So humidity provides a role. We're seeing a lot of emphasis now, right now on um, air systems, uh, uh, air filtration systems. We're seeing a lot of money spent by organizations. S some of it is evidence-based, some of it isn't evidence-based. And it's really important we understand what, you know, how do we control infectious disease agents in, in the air based on humidity, uh, directional, uh, the direction of the movement of air, 
uh, other factors we can do, we can use to decrease that risk, to get them either on the ground as quickly as possible or inactivate them. And what I'm seeing right now, Jeff, is a lot of stuff being purchased and implemented that really is not well supported. Um, again, I'll tell you that the fact that I go to so many restaurants and bathrooms in stadiums, arenas, convention centers, hotels, airports that don't have a lid, we've known this stuff for years, 20, 30 years, that you flush the toilet, it can create droplets in the air for 90 minutes to two hours. That is known. And I can show you all the great videos I have on, 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 on how that happens and why it happens. And, and the, th the thing is that bacteria, viruses are in those droplets. It's, it's a high risk area. So the important thing is, yes, air, air, is, air uh, is one of the areas where we have to do our risk assessment and, and come up with solutions, but it's not just a silver bullet. It's not one size fits all. It's air. It's touching surfaces. It's transmission of the virus on people as well as objects and things. We, so again, the challenge we've had so far, Jeff, is everyone wants to fo focus on one thing. Maybe it's the vaccine. Maybe it's the air. Maybe it's the surfaces. Maybe it's just on physical distancing. It's not. It's a multitude of solutions that come together in a comprehensive systems approach that decreases the risk from any infectious disease agent. Well, Gavin, I thought that question I might have thrown you, but you answered it nicely. So uh, good information. And by the way, when we do these questions, either one of you can comment. So Jeff, if you have something to add, uh, feel free to speak up. Um, but let's go to Amanda. I believe she has another question and uh, we'll read it. Hi guys, yeah. We have a, um, a lot of great questions coming in from the audience. Uh, first, uh, someone wanted clarification, Jeff. Um, you said uh, to when cleaning floors to clean at more than 120 degrees, but in the slide it said more than 200 degrees. So could you just clarify which is correct there? No, no, no okay. great, great. Then that was, a, that was a slip on my part then because it is, we were cleaning it over 200 degrees. Okay. I told you at the beginning, I mean, you know, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, so I'll slip. But here's the deal. You know, anybody that's, that's been in the cleaning industry for a long time knows 200 is, is, a, is a very magical number, simply for the fact that when you reach 200 degrees, you didn't double your cleaning proficiency. You increased it by 3,000%. So 200 degrees is a great number. So... Uh, my bad, my, I'm sorry, and thanks for asking that. No, it's 200, not 120. But to think, you know what, you also need to take into effect, if you're registering that temperature at your mobile cleaning plant or your truck mount, you're gonna lose degrees for every 50 feet of hose. And then if, you, if you're using uh, like a number four jet and it's three inches up above your surface, you're gonna lose seven degrees for each inch. So you've lost 21 degrees right there. So you have to take all of these things, cleaning is a science and it's an art, okay? But forensic restoration utilizes the sciences of bio-risk management, infection control, and the techniques of forensic cleaning and uh, proper disinfecting. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, William asks, uh, what about compatibility of disinfectants on plastics, metal, wood, et cetera? Many disinfectants can only be used on certain surfaces. Uh, I'll take, I'll, I'll take like the that. first one at that one, uh, and then I'll let Jeff follow up. The challenge we're having, again, with our, through our ISSA GBAC STAR program, we've done such a deep dive at the facility level with service providers, with cleaning companies. What we find is that because of restrictions or, or you know, problems with the supply chain, you may have one, two or three disinfection products only. And the challenge is people are using those disinfection products on all different services, regardless of what it says on the label. The biggest challenge we have in the clean industry right now is you have to read the label. And the challenge is I'm in my 50s and I can't read the label because the font's too damn small. And the problem is we've got to make those labels <laughs> easier to read. And one of the challenges we're facing right now is how do we take all that complex information where you may need a university or a PhD degree and put it in a way that the cleaning industry goes, now I get it. I know how to use the product and I know how to use it safely. So it's really important that, you know, that, that the question is so important right now. We've, been we've had challenges with supply chain issues. We've had problems with reading the label. And again, we're still seeing that I've got a disinfectant I've got a, a, a delivery system like Jeff Jones outlined, and I'm going to spray the whole damn room and just hope it works. 
we're going to move away from that and become more evidence-based. So it's really important. It's, it's a level of complexity that's going to require education and training to understand what products can be used on what surfaces. And I think really from the on-site visits that I do nearly every week, I'm not seeing it and we're not there yet. You know, there's an old joke in the uh, cleaning, because I was raised in this industry, in the cleaning industry, that the two least used items are measuring cups and labels. So, you know, when I was talking about harmonics and uh, professional disinfecting, the disinfectant, the delivery system, the, 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 the operator is key on that. Those are inanimate objects. It's the operator that reads the label. It's the operator that decides how these uh, disinfectants are dispensed. So it's, it all comes down, there's an old saying in the military, it all comes down to the man with the rifle. It all comes down to the operator. Well, I'll handle the next question. Great information. Here's an interesting one. I hear some products say they inactivate and other products say they kill. Which is best? Maybe inactivate. Gavin, you can start us off. Uh, inactivate, and I'm gonna tell you why. A virus is not a living organism like uh, gram negative or gram positive bacteria in just layman's terms, because Gavin will come on, come on and blow it away with science. And I'm just gonna explain it like the half breed cowboy that I am, okay? A virus is more like a zombie. And so what it does, it attaches itself to a host. It turns on a copy machine and it keeps replicating until it either burns itself out or that host dies. And so it's either active or it's inactive. Gavin? No, that you're absolutely right, Jeff. And this is this is a real challenge we have when it comes to terminology. Um, everyone understands what kill means. Kill. If I kill something, I'm safe. It's really a challenging from a risk risk communication perspective to say, oh, I'm going to inactivate this virus. And Jeff Jones is absolutely correct. It's not a living agent, so we do inactivate it. But for people, the general public, um, to understand that inactivation leads to safety is a really big gap to fill. So you'll hear us, uh, as we, depending on what audience we talk to, whether we uh, interchange with inactivate, which is the correct term, or we actually use kill so they just get it and understand what we're doing does make it. And so again, everything we do today is focused on safety. Safety in the building, safety in, in, in the indoor space, safety for the, for the worker, the janitorial cleaning staff, both from the product and the, and the disease, the infectious disease agent, but also safety from the user of going in that building. And the challenge is we, as, as a cleaning industry, have to tell the public very clearly, this is what, what we do, this is why we do it, because we care for you, we love you, and we're making things safe. Terminology, that's tough. And by the way, Jeff, uh, if you want to sound like Gavin, I know you do accents. So, you know, feel free to do that sometime today as well. Amanda, give us another question. Okay. Um, Jason asks, could you please discuss what technology, if any, is being used to validate a surface is disinfected? Is ATP accepted even though it won't detect viruses? What about PCR? Well, let me just, I'm going to pass that on to Gavin in a second. But remember what each tool in your toolbox is for. Okay, if we're in the military, you know, a hand grenade is a great weapon, but I would not use it if I were attacked in a phone booth. Wrong weapon, wrong choice. Okay, the ATP was not designed to uh, identify viruses, nor was it designed to uh, detect the effective effectiveness of a disinfectant. It was designed to measure a level of cleanliness. Now, are they working uh, with more testing now? You bet they are. Can you swab something and send it off to a lab? You bet you can. But as a forensic operator, let me tell you that a lot of times when I show up, I don't, time is not a luxury I have a lot. I've got to get in and get to work and take that hostile environment and turn it into a very hygienic and user-friendly environment um, as quick as I can. But... Um, without violating any steps of the protocol. That's it. Okay, Gavin on testing. Yeah, so ISSA ISA has published in the past uh, two cleaning standards uh, that established a framework to, again, one helps schools to establish, uh, you know, cleaning effectiveness measurements. Uh, another one is for uh, commercial buildings. 
And that really circles around and focuses on using of ATP meters. Now we know from the work that we do with manufacturers as the work we do with facilities through our GBAC STAR program, we have seen uh, the purchase procurement of ATP meters, it's really a high level. We've seen the use in facilities increase in 2020. But what I'm, the biggest challenge is, are they using them properly? Are they using them the way they design? Do they use them before they clean or uh, and after they clean? And do they use them before they disinfect? Now that is again, just measuring the level of how filthy or dirty, both invisible and visible dirt is versus how effective your cleaning is. The challenge we have when it comes to infectious disease agents, we need to go one step higher with technology and, 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 and testing. So we, are, we do know of facilities that do take swabs they take swabs on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, some are using real-time PCR and that just detects the presence of that. But even when the virus is inactivated, it can still give a positive. So again, it may not be infectious, but we are also seeing some other technology out there. We're seeing swabs taken around facilities, again, that are designated high risk, they're very important. The cost has come down considerably that actually can then go and culture for the virus. That takes a little bit longer time to do it. Is it part of what we do normally? No, because it's an added cost. And when we try to add cost to the clean industry, we've got to go work out, is there, a, is there a worthwhile return on investment? So really right now, visual inspections, watching your protocols and procedures. Did you clean and disinfect exactly as you were trained to do? And two, another one, you can use ATP meters to, 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 to actually evaluate the level of you know, your cleaning ability in going from dirty to clean. And then the next one is we can actually go another level by taking swabs. And so there are facilities out there that we know through our GBAC star program that are doing swabs on a weekly basis. Does everyone need to do it? No. What you need to go is go back to your first principles. Can I clean and disinfect to inactivate a virus properly? And if you do that through visual inspections and you know you're doing it properly, then you, you probably don't need to pay a lot more money to do other testing, to, but it goes back to your risk assessment and where you are right now. And so again, I, th I see the whole clean industry moving more to validation techniques and procedures in 2021 and beyond. So here's a, another question. Uh, when applying disinfectant, or I'm gonna say this for Jeff Jones, when fogging it, I know you love that word, Jeff. Do we need to wear PPE? How many years had I said been in this industry over 50? Let me just tell you a story really quick. I remember when I was young, my dad came back in the back of the warehouse and we we're mixing some stuff and he said, son, Unless you're mixing water, you better have some safety gear on, okay? Uh, I don't care what you're spraying. Unless it's water, you need to have PPE on. Protect yourself. You know, you need to have some eye protection, some respiratory protection. You need to have some gloves. If you're going in to do a site assessment, an incident site risk assessment, then you need to have respiratory protection, eye protection. Like Gavin said, plug your holes. You need to have some gloves on, and you need to have uh, some some foot, per, foot per, uh, wear protection on that you can dispose of, that you can doff as you are leaving that incident site so you don't track and transfer, transfer contaminants right through there. But the answer is, unless it's, wa unless it's water, put on some PPE. I imagine Gavin uh, agrees with you. Anything to add, Gavin? A lot of it's on the safety data sheets of the products that you're using. And the challenge we have is that it's hard to find these safety data sheets. Again, it's hard to read the label, uh, the font size too small, but it's more importantly, again, as a cleaning industry, we have to do better in getting that information out there. Is it, is it another piece of paper? Is it a website? Is it a YouTube video? What are What's the best way to deliver these safety messages based on using chemicals, using disinfectants, using product and understand that, yes, this is how you have to wear the gloves. This is how you protect your eyes, your nose and your mouth. This is how you protect your clothing. This is how you protect your loved ones. We've got to do a better job at that. And then at the moment it's all paper-based or website-based it's hard to read and understand and, and actually visualize. I think we're going to go to more videos, more visualization, but it's again, more both online and face-to-face -face training. So people understand there is a risk. There is something you can mitigate for. And it's, you do this based on the product, the chemical you use, and also the, the equipment. All right, thank you, Gavin. Amanda, do we have another one? Yes, we have lots more. <laughs> Um, we're, we have several questions on the use of aqueous ozone. Um, we see, uh, Bert says, we see a lot of focus on chemical applications for disinfecting. Why not ozone gas or ozonated water that kills germs effectively? 
Um, ozonate, uh, ozonated water and upholstery or carpet cleaning, for instance, would kill and clean effectively or use in conjunction with an approved cleaner for redundancy. <laughs> um, can you speak to aqueous ozone? That's a long question. Who wants to handle that one? Yeah, that's, yeah listen, that's a long question. Okay, going back to when I was young and we would have uh, unattended deaths, you know, which can lead to like, you know, an overload of odiferous molecules. You remove the source. Ozone's always been good. They use ozone in clean rooms today to help disinfect. But uh, do I have enough experience with uh, ozone, ozone water to even give an opinion? No, so I'm not going to. OK, uh, I've got my methods and uh, they're proven uh, and not that that makes me any better than anybody. It's just I don't have any working experience. So if I don't have working experience and I can't give you true factual field based data, I'm not going to say anything. Well, perhaps what we could do, Amanda, is uh, make a note of that and we'll we'll answer that offline when we get more research done. Unless yes. Gavin has something to add to that question. Okay, here's another one. Um, what should we look for on the label when choosing a disinfectant? Shorter question, but an important one. People want products, what do they look for? I'm looking for, any, first of all, an EPA registration. Um, I want an EPA registered hospital grade tuberculocidal disinfectant with a six log kill, proven to kill both gram negative, gram positive bacteria and inactivate both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. That's what I look for. And that, that's a good question, Jeff. We've made it too hard for ourselves. We're our own, we're our own worst enemy. Um, the fact that, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm looking at the US CDC site guidance for cleaning and disinfecting public spaces, workplaces, businesses, schools, and homes. It was updated on January 5th. There is nothing there that's easy. There's nothing there that tells us that, you know, Again, yes, it mentions the EPA list N, which a majority of those disinfectants are for hard, non-porous non surfaces. It says nothing about UVC light. It says nothing about other technologies like ozone. It says nothing about delivery systems. But more importantly, it says nothing about validating cleaning and disinfection. And so when I, when I work with so many companies, so many facilities, and they say, oh, we follow what CDC says, or even OSHA, or some other regulatory body, that, that level of specificity on doing what we need to do and do it properly is just not there. And that's something I think as a, as a clean industry, we need to work towards. You can look at this website, you know, just Google CDC guidance for clean disinfectant and you see exactly what I'm talking about. It, the information there to make it easy, to make it safe, to make it work is not there. Let's just do a couple more questions. Amanda, give us another one. Um, so uh, Mike asks, some marketing touts a 30 day plus continued sanitization. Is that even possible? Yeah, you wanna take that Gavin? Because you don't even wanna get me started on that, okay? Uh, look, life is full of possibilities and probabilities, okay? Is it possible? Well, yeah, is it probable? No. OK, a lot of those uh, what you're talking about, those residual kills or protective coatings, the most popular one is like a spike system where the bacteria or the viruses fall on the spikes. Well, not if people are constantly using that in touch points, doorknobs and things of that nature, OK, because they're going to break off the spikes or not if it's aggressively cleaned. So is it possible? Yeah, but, you know, why not clean? Why not clean? Uh, I'm not, until there's more scientific data, and I'm sure there's people jumping up and down mad right now. They're like, oh, you don't know, you didn't read this report. That's right, I haven't. Okay, I was probably too busy working out in the field. But, uh, and, and technology's changing all the time, but I, I wouldn't bet my life on it. I wouldn't bet my health on it. I keep cleaning and disinfecting. And it's so important. Yeah, without knowing the person who ask the question, uh, they're probably talking about cleaning and applying a residual my antimicrobial that'll keep working. Yeah, Kevin? well, I call a micro barrier. Mm. And, and that technology is exciting. Uh, the challenges we work, you know, Jeff and I both work in the real world, like everyone else on this call probably works in the real world. Uh, as you put down a coating on a surface, you get dirt, dust, other material on it. The infect it, get, it covers up that material. That happens right. over time. 
And so it's really important from your risk assessment, again, determine what needs to be cleaned, determine how it'll be disinfected, whether it's cleaning and disinfection frequently or it's putting on, on, a, on using another piece of technology, you can do that through a risk assessment. And then again, consider those resources and equipment needed based on your risk assessment, based on that hazard. And the hazard right now is SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also other infectious diseases like flu, norovirus, hepatitis that, that we deal with all the time. So it's really important understand the infectious disease agent, understand how it survives on the surfaces. All that research is done. It's poorly understood within the clean industry that hepatitis C does remain infective on a hard non-porous surface for up to six weeks. Everyone should know that stuff because it's so important that we, we tell people this is why we do what we do. And C. diff can go for months. And there's thousands of people that die from C. diff every year. And let me tell you something, that's a heck of a lot a uh, tougher um, agent to negotiate than an enveloped virus. It's gram positive bacteria that leaves a very hardy spore. And now we've just raised the threat level on that. You know, I've talked to some doctors right now, tuberculosis is what sets the bar on that. But I've, I've talked to quite a few doctors that say they'd like to see C. diff set that bar. So let's do one more question. Um, either one of you can answer this one. It's about eco-friendly or plant-based products. Are they effective as disinfectants? I think if you go to the EPA list N, uh, we are all about, you know, again, chemicals, chemicals can damage surfaces. Chemicals can hurt people. So it's really important that you use those as products as the manufacturer and the safety data sheet has, has it mentions, you wear the appropriate PPE, you use it the way in the, the dilution that's required. But even on the EPA list end, there's a lot of products out there that are made of, have active ingredients that we know are less corrosive, uh, less harmful to people. There's probably you know, at least 30 or 40 products I know on the EPA list end that are alternatives. We know there are challenges in supply chain issues, but it's really important that, again, we look at what we're trying to do and how we do it. All these products have a dwell or wet contact time, can be from a few minutes up to 10 minutes. Again, look at what, you know, I, I was asked the other day, Jeff, how to clean and disinfect a grand piano from, from SARS-CoV-2 virus. And guess what I did? I wrapped it up in plastic and I spray the plastic because I'm not touching the grand piano. I'm not, I don't have insurance to do that. So again, I came up with a, a way that I could actually cover that surface while we're in the middle of this pandemic. And then I can clean that outside of that plastic without damaging the surface. Um, there are green products, so there are green label products. There are products that are, are less toxic to the environment as well as to people. Read the label, the information is there. If you don't understand that, then reach back out to Clean Facts, reach back out to ISA, GG back team, and we'll help Measure, you know, help you understand. And I, I want to really apologize because a lot of the safety data sheets and manufacturers records are just too complicated, but we'll help you understand what works, what doesn't work, and then what level of protection you need to protect both the environment and the operator. Sure. I don't think anybody wants to uh, leave behind any type of toxic chemical residual. And I think that we should understand that there's low level disinfecting and high level disinfecting. And so if you want to really get into high level disinfecting, you're going to be looking at things that were created for DARPA, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency for the US government post 9-11. And you're going to be looking at products that uh, were developed at Sandia Labs. Okay, that's the brainiacs of the US government. These are guys that came up with uh, the uh, nuclear bombs for World War II. And, uh, They've got some extremely effective, both of those have extremely effective disinfecting systems that are basically non-residual and eco-friendly. Well, great information. Uh, appreciate all those responses to our questions. And I know you folks have more questions, but our time is up today. Before we conclude, I do want to thank our webinar sponsors, Procure and Victory Innovations, and our two experts, Gavin and Jeff. And I also want to thank Amanda Hosey, our managing editor for Clean Facts, who puts all this together. And without her, we'd be in big trouble. So all of you will receive an email with a link to this presentation by the end of the week. And it'll also be on cleanfacts.com as well. But if you don't receive Clean Facts, be sure to take an opportunity to visit cleanfacts.com and sign up for our print or digital publication. But thank you all for attending. Have a great day.